Good evening and welcome to this edition of History and Highballs. Uh, we're so glad that you're joining us for this evening's program celebrating National Poetry Month, uh, History and Highballs, A Walk in the Woods with Carl Sandburg. My name is Stacy, and I handle adult education here at the museum. So whenever you join us for one of these History and Highballs programs, you and I get to virtually spend the evening together listening to some incredible stories about North Carolina places and people and what makes our state so special. Tonight's program is just one of many exciting virtual offerings available through MOH. So if you'd like to learn more about our History at Home initiative, we invite you to head over to the museum's website at www.ncmuseumofhistory.org. Uh, this is also where you can find out more information about shopping in our wonderful museum shop, as well as joining our North Carolina Museum of History Associates. Uh, our associates and foundation provide crucial funding and support to the museum, which in addition to many other things, helps make programming like this evening's program happen. Uh, we would like to thank all of those of you who graciously donated funds towards this evening's program. We do our best to keep our programs free to attend, uh, but there are costs associated with keeping our series going, and we just continue to be so appreciative of your generous support of the museum. A few quick housekeeping items for this evening. We ask that you please keep your mics muted throughout the entirety of the event, and to please type any questions that you have for our guest speakers into the chat function located at the bottom center of your screen. At the end of the program, I will ask our speakers as many of your questions as time allows. Uh, so it's my honor to introduce this evening's speakers, Victoria Flanagan, past president of Historic Flat Rock Incorporated, um, board of directors, uh, Steve Carlisle, playwright, actor, and educator, and, and Ella Ausler, uh, forgive me, Ella, if I said that incorrectly, Flat Rock poet. Uh, Flanagan recently served as president of Historic Flat Rock Incorporated and is a passionate proponent of all things Flat Rock. Carlisle enjoyed a career in the theater, film, and television that spanned more than 30 years and included off-Broadway performances, work with Charles Nelson Riley and the National Shakespeare Company, and tours with shows in schools and theaters across the country, as well as roles in several soap operas and primetime programs. The Flat Rock resident retired from Western Carolina University in 2013. He wrote the Sandbergs of Connemara, which we hopefully will get, a, get to see it, listen to a piece of this evening, a one act play compromised of 12 vignettes depicting the Sandbergs from 1945 until 1967. His brother, Michael, created the play's score and its three songs. Ausler is a Flat Rock poet who won the 2018 Carl Sandburg Student Poetry Contest. Okay, so Ella, I think you're going to start us off with a reading. I'm going to turn it over to you now. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Stacey. It's really great to be here, and it's great to see so many people who are interested in what's happening. And, you know, uh, Carl Sandburg is a really, honestly, amazing person and poet. And I'm going to be reading um, first. Carl Sandburg's poem titled, I am the people, the mob. I'm the people, the mob, the crowd, the mass. Do you know that all the great work of the world is done through me? I'm the working man, the inventor, the maker of the world's food and clothes. I am the audience that witnesses history. The Napoleons come from me and the Lincolns, they die. And then I sent forth more Napoleons and Lincolns. I am the seed ground. I am a prairie that will stand for much plowing. Terrible storms pass over me. I forget. The best of me is sucked out and wasted. I forget. Everything but death comes to me and makes me work and give up what I have and I forget. Sometimes I growl, shake myself and spatter a few red drops for history to remember. Then I forget when I, the people, learn to remember, when I, the people, use the lessons of yesterday and no longer forget who wronged me last year, who played me for a fool. Then there will be no speaker in all the world say the name, the people, with any fleck of a sneer in his voice or any far off smile of derision. The mob, the crowd, the mass will arrive then. Thank you. And that is the end of the poem. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Lucy Meminger Pinckney. 
over a hundred years before Carl Sandburg learned of Flat Rock, North Carolina. My father, Christopher Gustavus Memminger, came under the spell of the mountains. In 1838, Papa was a lawyer in Charleston and additionally was chairman of the House of Representative Ways and Means Committee. Charleston had experienced a fire that year and the first bill that was introduced and passed was to secure funds to rebuild the city. Loans from the bank of the state were given to families who had lost everything so they could be rebuilt. The scrutiny of my father was known by all. He believed that banks were for the use of all people, not just the privileged few, except for us children. Remarkable lives both, Sandberg and my father. It was said by many that he was in his speech lucid, direct and earnest. The same could be said of Sandberg. Sandberg could have well measured verse as he was moved deep in his soul, responsive in music and poetry. The personalities of these men were different, yet they were both drawn to the solitude of Flat Rock. With the wind coming through the valley, down the slope from Glassy Mountain. Papa kept Rock Hill as a working farm. He added land to his holdings when he purchased additional acreage from a neighbor, Aaron Smith Willington, along the Saluda Path. We now can look back at the imperfections of the time, the time before emancipation and the opinions of Northerners and Southerners. Granted, not all Southerners or Northerners held the same beliefs. Ignorance was bountiful. On a large scale, people did not understand anyone who may have looked different from them, speak differently, or hold differing religious beliefs. This is where the two men differed. And I propose that they were diametrically opposites on a political scale. Give this some thought. If the two men dined together, and discussed politics. Can you imagine the conversation? Sandberg discussing calmly the rights of the people, all people, and Papa struggling with the reconciliation of the end of slavery with the post-slavery world. If we added Lincoln to the table, could a conversation ensue? Lastly, how is this similar? to where we find ourselves today. During Papa's time, a railroad system, the company under his presidency, was designed to travel from the ports to the Blue Ridge and through the mountains. Who would have known that part of that rail system would bring the Sandberg Library from Michigan to North Carolina? When Papa died, the property changed title twice before Lillian, known as Paula Sandberg, found and purchased the property, sight unseen by her husband, Carl. The name had been changed from Rock Hill to Connemara in 1900, a name that remains today. As Shakespeare declared in Hamlet, there is a divinity that shapes our ends. Hamlet, who would then account for the moral forces constantly at work in our humanity and inciting us to action. Papa and Sandberg were purposeful in their lives and have left behind them a history that only brightens or most certainly informs us as the ages go by. They both preserved their individuality. They adhered to their principles and they learn from those who came before them on the stage of life. Neither men were boastful, even though many men of their standing and intellect from their respective times were so. 
Let's remember, the Sandbergs lived for 22 years in Flat Rock. They witnessed the spectacular colors in the horizon, the color that gives the Blue Ridge its name. Carl Sandberg wrote over 800 poems, a six volume biography of Abraham Lincoln. For many of us, he is also remembered as a public speaker, a singing vagabond, and his deep belief in the common man. He died at Connemara on July 22nd, 1967. His life was a life of an American. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Steve Carlisle and cheers. This is a glass of bourbon. Cheers again. Mm. Now, if you had gone to Connemara to visit Carl or Lillian from somewhere in 45 to 67, they would not have met you with an alcoholic drink because this was a dry county. And so uh, Lillian would give you a drink of goat's milk from one of her champion goats. Uh, I doubt to say anybody in our audience tonight is drinking goat's milk. Uh, maybe Ellen. Ellen, are you drinking goat's milk there? No, she's not. So anyway, uh, if you've ever tasted goat's milk, uh, you might understand why her guest or his guest would bring a chaser from wherever they live and they would leave the bottle with the Sandbergs. And so we figured most people would have come with bourbon and would have left bourbon there for Carl. And maybe he drank it. There's nowhere in my research that I found that he liked anything, but that at one time he did drink some ancient age. Now, uh, the, the thing about, uh, uh, Lillian and the uh, the goats. Those that was hers. Carl was a writer. He uh, spent most of his time up on the third floor, where he uh, uh, had his office, and he would write at night. And this was because when he was a young boy, uh, he had a film over his eyes, and the doctor at that time wanted to take that film off. And they didn't know if that removal would uh, leave him blind. So they took it off and it was successful, but it also had some after effects, which he was very light sensitive. And if you see a lot of those pictures of Carl, he is wearing that telegraph operator's uh, visor over his eyes. He usually uh, has a hat on maybe if he's outside, but he slept most of the early morning away. And then later on, he would, uh, you know, get out into uh, Connemara and he would take a walk or he would take his guitar, but he always had uh, number two pencils with him. And he always carried pocket knives. Always. He loved them. And he always uh, had his cigar. And he and these are Wheeler cigars. And you can do a Google search on them. And the Wheeler cigars, he would cut in half. And he would either smoke or he would let, let kind of chew one. Then he would always have a, a lot of number two pencils and he would take those pocket knives and keep those pencils sharpened all the time. Uh, it was said by Paula, his granddaughter, that he, was, he loved to tear pictures out of magazines and newspapers. And when I say tear, I mean cut. The little pocket knives were so sharp that he could get a real easy, straight cut. And if he saw something in an, an article in a paper or a magazine or something, he was so proficient with that little knife that he was able to cut that out of the magazine or newspaper without damaging the next page. And you know, on a newspaper, 
that takes some skill. So the man would carry in his pocket, uh, and believe me, he loved goat's milk. Goat's milk, he, they loved it. Uh, and like I said, this was Paula's, I mean, Lillian's thing. When they had the house up in Michigan in the 40s, where they had built them a house up there, Lillian wanted a farm. And when uh, Carl and Lillian were courting, they said that was what they wanted to have. They wanted to have a farm together. He was going to be the writer and she was going to be the farmer. And, and she was raising chickens and uh, the, the goats didn't come into it. She wanted a cow. Her and her, their youngest daughter, Helga, wanted a cow. And Carl, in his early life, had milked cows, had got up early in the morning and walked and milked the cows and got the milk ready and delivered it and then brought the bottles home. Nuh -uh, he didn't want a cow. Well, she went to buy a cow and they were selling goats. And the woman showed her that she bought, ended up buying this goat. She bought the goat and brought it home and they drank the milk and they liked it. And then Lillian, who was a very smart, exciting lover of poetry. She was a high school teacher, Latin. She, a highly educated young woman who fell in love with Carl Sandburg. Anyway, her goats and she and her younger daughter, Helga, they went and started showing the goats at these different fairs and everything. And she started winning prizes with these goats. And the way you win a prize, the way you become a champion, is that you have to give a certain amount of milk in uh, a certain amount of days. And they were winning ribbons and everything, and they wanted to extend their champions uh, of the herd. And so they bought a, uh, uh, an old trailer and hooked it up to a station wagon they had. And Helga and Lillian would take the goats around to the fairs and do all that. And then one day she said, we need a bigger place. Michigan is not going to hold us. We, got, we want to expand the herd and it's too cold up here. We need a place where we can raise our goats. And so she began to look for another place. And what she wanted was where the grass in the pasture would stay green 10 months out of the year. And she had remembered on a vacation trip down to, I think somewhere in Florida, they had stopped at the Grove Park Inn in Asheville. And she remembered the smell of the air. She said, oh, love this. And so she began to look for places down here uh, near the Asheville area. And lo and behold, a large farm that named Connemara, 245 acres. It was at the time of World War II. All the young men had left and gone to war. There weren't a lot of people to work the farm. Everybody was working in war uh, factories and things like that. And so here was this farm and she and Helga came here for the goats because Carl just needed the peace and quiet. And they found Connemara and they fell in love with it because the barn was far enough away from the house and all the activity of farming. And the one thing that Carl had to have was what he called the creative hush. The creative hush. And that's where all he had to listen to were the birds and the wind blowing through the trees. And yes, there were the sounds, but there were horses in the pasture out front. It had a three hole golf course on it because the man that owned Connemara before them was from Ireland, was of Irish heritage. And he had put in a golf course. And now this is not like any golf course you'll ever see. This was rough in it. But anyway, they, they, uh, Helga and Paula or Lillian came down. They saw it. They loved it. They brought 
those goats with them in the station wagon and the house trailer. And Carl stayed up there with Margaret. Janet traveled with Helga and Lillian and Margaret and Carl packed up the, the house in Michigan, the books on a box car of a train, which nobody could get at that time, but Carl Sandberg was very good friends with FDR uh, administration in Washington, was able to get a box car to bring all those books down here. They, they had to go back at one time and get all the lumber that was in the house they had built. They had put, put shelves up because he had about 10,000 copies of books and they had to bring that lumber down and put those white bookcases that you see if you ever visit Connemara. That's what you'll see. That, though, that's part of the house up in Michigan that was brought down here to Connemara. Carl lived upstairs, like I said, in the third floor where his office was. Now, he had orange crates and you'd say, why? Why would this man have so many orange crates to hold his papers and his books and everything up there? Well, this man loved eating oranges, but he didn't peel the orange. He ate the orange peeling and all. It's the way when he was young, they, they were very, very poor. And when given an orange, they ate it like it was an apple. And so all his life, he ate oranges like they were apples. He drank goat's milk and liked it. And after supper, his, he would drink coffee after supper. Everybody loves that. But he would put honey in it and goat's milk. And I've heard that will make whiskers grow on the end of your nose. So if you want that to happen to you, try that drink sometime, okay? Cheers to you on, on that. Now, I wanna, I wanna tell you about, but Carl being so poor, he, uh, when they were young, he wanted to be a baseball player. He went by the name of Sully and he was pretty good. I, he was a pretty good ball player. Remember, he had that problem with the eyes. That was going to give him some problem. And then he stepped on a piece of glass out in the baseball field and cut his foot. And that gave him a little bit of trouble all the rest of his life. He, uh, he belonged to a gang. <laughs> it was called the Dirty Dozen. And uh, they, got, uh, they got put in jail one time because they went swimming naked in a, uh, a pond. So he, he was just a, a good kid. He was a poor kid. He dropped out of school in the eighth grade. He uh, served in uh, the army. He served in the army in the Spanish-American War. He volunteered. And he went to Cuba, they landed in Cuba, but then they went to Puerto Rico. And he said the only thing he thought there were the mosquitoes. And so when he came back from that campaign, the men in his company, they, what they were saying, they said, if you can send any person in your company to West Point, who would you send? Well, they sent Carl Sandburg. He said he didn't see himself as a soldier, but he said, you know, I felt this was a real honor for the, the guys to sort of choose me uh, to go to West Point. So he went to West Point and he took the entrance exam, which uh, he failed. He failed the grammar and he failed the arithmetic. And so he left uh, West Point and he came back. And uh, one of the things that Carl did all during his, uh, I guess, youth was one of these. This, he sold these to farmers, uh, to people. He'd ride his rented bicycle out through the plains and he would sell 
This is a Underwood stereo, uh, stereoscopic viewer. And what you do is you put this picture, there's two pictures of the same thing. You put it in this viewer and you look through and it makes the figures in that sort of 3D. Now, I'm sure that many of you have gone to your great grandmother's house or something like that, and you've seen these. And this is what Carl, he sold these. He, like I said, he worked in a dairy. He uh, worked on a uh, uh, magazine. He worked on newspapers, uh, oddball. And then, uh, and he, he was so poor his father worked 10 hours a day, six days a week. They never had a vacation. They never, ever got to go anywhere as a family. And so he became very, very energetic in uh, making sure that uh, poor people, and especially children, he was very much against uh, uh, children working, some of them as young as eight years old, in factories and on the farms, child labor laws were what pushed him into uh, the Socialist Democratic Party. He also married a woman, Lillian Steichen, who could not vote. And she, and that was the law of the land, women could not vote. Well, she and Carl, they, 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 they melded together like honey and salt. Oh no, not salt. But I mean, they were, they were just made for each other. I want to read for you uh, one thing that he wrote about her. Uh, this is one of his poems that uh, now, when they first met, <laughs> they didn't, uh, they, they had met in an office in Milwaukee. She was walking out of the office and he was walking in and the guy that he was going to see and she was just leaving there, the owner of a magazine, I think, uh, he was smited with her right off the bat. And he, he just, he said, can I take you to dinner? And she thought, well, I, I'm not going to dinner with a man I don't even know, a stranger. And she said, no. And she was getting ready to go and he, he said, well, can I have your address to send you some of my articles that I'm writing about socialism? And she said, okay. So she and he began writing each other. And some of these letters are like 50 pages long and they fell in love with their writing. She loved his poetry. She got him to change his name from Charles Sandberg to Carl Sandberg. And this is what they did on their, their wedding was that they both changed their name. She was Lillian, he was Charles, and they changed their names at that time to begin their new life together as Carl Sandberg and Paula which is a term of endearment from their country of Luxembourg, where they were uh, ancestors were from. Paula was a, a term of endearment. Like here in America, we call people honey, sweetheart, baby. That's what that Paula meant. So a lot of people like to say he called every woman Paula. Well, it was, it happens here in the South. It happens all over. We, we have a term of endearment for people. Uh, uh, I will find this poem here. I've got standing in the dark, but I'll find it. But one thing I wanted to tell you about was, see this bowl? Bowls like this were kept all over Connemara. And if you were out walking in the day and you saw an interesting leaf, or an interesting rock, or a, a, a branch of, uh, or a stick, you would bring it into the house and you would put it in the bowl. And then when dinner time came, and there were bowls like this and cans and whatever, 
But then at dinner time, they would bring these plates to the dinner table and they would sit around and talk about, oh, look at, look at this leaf. Who, who, who did, oh, okay, and this acorn, this is interesting, tell me about this. But it was the conversation around the table. Sometimes he would read, uh, sometimes the kids that were there, you gotta remember, there were seven people that lived at Connemara. And uh, Helga baked, four loaves of bread every day. And they loved, they had honey. They, if you go to the house and you will see he has a chair there and by his chair is a toaster. And he loved eating toast. Now, when they were young, because they're poor, toast spread with lard, and if you really get fancy with it, you put salt on it, salt on it. Uh, let me find this poem here. He, uh, he and Lillian, there, there are a lot of good books that are written about, uh, well, there's a whole book about their letters, their romance that was edited by uh, Margaret, their oldest daughter. Now, Margaret, had epilepsy. And at that time, the care of epilepsy was in a very infantile thing. And uh, so she stayed at home. Janet, the next daughter, had been hit by a car when she was 16 and been in a coma for a week. And she came out of that and she was very, mm, uh, she had had some damage done. And so she she was the one at home who kind of looked after all the baby animals, the little rabbits, the little uh, uh, goats and all. And the oldest daughter, Margaret, uh, played the piano and uh, she kind of was her father's secretary in that she knew where all the books were, a librarian, and his house was nothing but a library. But I want to read to you what, what Carl Sandberg wrote to Lillian Steichen. Uh, I never knew any more beautiful than you. I have hunted you under my thoughts. I have broken down under the wind and into the roses looking for you. And I shall never find any greater than you. Well, I fell in love with him when I read that. Uh, the Poet and the Farmer. Uh, it's a great romance. I recommend it to you highly. It's a wonderful story to, uh, uh, to find out about this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful American family. We're so honored to have them have chosen Connemara to live here. Uh, I drive by it every day. And I am inspired every day as I look up there and I read the stories. And just, just to take his autobiography, uh, Always the Young Stranger, or a book of his poetry, or uh, just go up there and take your number two pencil and write your own poetry. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful place. Uh, I do hope that each and every one of you will take the opportunity now that we're through this pandemic and come to Connemara and take a walk in the woods with Carl. The 245 acres is still there. The park service keeps it looking great. And if you really want to walk through the house, the books are all back. Uh, you can go up. Uh, one, thing, one thing I would ask you to, to pay attention to are the bird feeders and the bird houses that are up there. This was how they spent their money on bird seed so that they could have the pleasure of seeing all the different birds come up there. And you, and you can walk around the house. And I mean, uh, these are not bird houses that you'd find at Ace Hardware. These are bird houses that are made out of anything that would uh, work as a bird house. And uh, I, I think uh, they should have a bird house tour but, uh, and, and, you know, put a few bird seed in your, 
pocket and throw it out there for the birds. It's a wonderful place. We'd love to have you up here. Uh, I'll shut up now and let others, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read uh, part of my uh, uh, play. I'm gonna, they, they said I could read the first uh, monologue of my play, and I'll do that after uh, some of the questions, I guess. Uh, so I'll wave out and let the hostess take over, and then I'll come back on and read the first part of my play, The Sandbirds of Panama. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Ella, I believe that you're gonna read another poem for us. Yeah, I, I'd love to. So this next one I'll be reading is actually the one I wrote for um, the Carl Sandburg Poetry Contest a few years ago. So I'll be sharing it because yeah, I believe it fits the theme. So um, it's titled, When Dreams Are Overrun. Moon glowed pale, sun shone bright, side by side in day and night. Pushed by rain, pulled by tide, searching for clams wherein pearls hide, sinking down, down in the sand, where water blur sea and land. Sergeant Major gives command, black and yellow, band, stripe band, far away, are the deep tides calmer? Where the soil is gone and life lives longer? This alien environment forgotten by time where strange things happen below the brine. At last, arising through the fog, emerging, feet anchored on mossy pine log, fig, birch, sky, dirt, salty pools melt into the earth. Cold and warm, far and near, houses, people, towns appear, a dock, a boat, a thatched mud home, but one man stands by, all alone, with lure, bait, line, and pole, one meal or more, his solemn goal, eyes looking, absorbing the scene, mind, body, and life serene. Then once more, shoved along the way, leaving boat and dock and bay, approaching summer, forest, tree, leaf, and vine, far from the sea, where no rules are written by hands so bold, and untouched is the soil heavy with gold, and the tortoise keeps its shell and lives to grow old. When the sun smiles on life itself, an oak is home to mushroom shelf, and crimson is the sunset warm with health, and man seldom comes to such a place of wealth. But alas, the idle mind returns to the ambitions of which it always yearns, and city and building crowd out the sun, who never smiles at what man has become. And ground has been reaped for all its worth, and horse, once free, is now saddled by girth, and life crawls on, deprived of mirth. Opposites coming together at last, sea so deep, blue, and vast, fog in little seaside town, forest and tree letting cold rain down, an uncivilized garden paradise, threatened by malignant man's cruel vice, and breathing deep, the mind awakes and forgets the dreams in which it partakes, and opposites slip away, making way for bright, bright day. Alas, but a dream, but a fantasy, so close, so close, a dream of peace and equality, of differences meeting and becoming as one, but all rushes apart when dreams are overrun. Thank you very much. That was beautiful, Ella. Thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, so we have a couple of questions um, from audience members. The first one is, um, did Carl Sandburg continue his newspaper man career after moving to North Carolina? Uh, no, he, he spent his time working on, uh, he had, he went to Hollywood uh, he worked on, a, uh, they were, they bought the rights to Remembrance Rock, his only work of fiction. And uh, he was uh, working on that in 48. And then in like 65, he uh, went out and got on to uh, uh, the greatest story ever told. And he uh, got the screenwriting credits for that. And so, and he was, he was a rutabaker stories he had going. Uh, he had a lot of, a lot, of, and he finished up the second half of his autobiography 
so he was working on his, uh, his writing at that time. And uh, I'm sure that the newspapers would have loved to have had him, but he, uh, he, he, he spent his time writing poetry, the whole thing. So. Uh, the next question is, did Carl Sandburg write bios for people other than Lincoln? Do you know? Uh, that's a good question. I, I, the, what he started out writing on Lincoln was uh, uh, he believed that the young children did not know enough about Abraham Lincoln. They didn't think he, he didn't think they had enough history about him. So he, he wanted to write uh, about for the kids. But what happened was that he, it got, it, it got huge, massive. And uh, that was the uh, that was the uh, the six volume set that he got, and this and these and finally he he uh, abridged uh, that whole set down for young people. And some of you may have had this three volume set when you were a young person. And so, uh, but I don't think he wrote about anybody else. He. He had a, he loved uh, Grant, he loved Lee uh, because they had, they had had so much of a, uh, a similar or a parallel life to what Abraham Lincoln had. But if you have not read his six volumes of Lincoln and the history of our country, uh, you, you've surely missed something because it's a, it's a wonderful piece of work and it still holds up as the, uh, you know, the, the just a, when you think of Lincoln, you think of his biography or, yeah, of the, of the man. But no, no other thing. Sorry. Our next question is from Jerry. They ask, did Carl Sandburg's children also become poets? Where do his grandchildren live now? Do you know? Well, uh, uh, Paula, uh, I think still that who is the granddaughter, who is Helga's daughter, which is the youngest daughter of Carl and Lillian, uh, lived here in uh, Hendersonville, and she just lost her uh, her her own daughter, who died on a, an excursion up in Alaska, uh, and uh, they brought her body back here. And uh, she was given a service out at uh, uh, Canuga mm -hmm. Conference. By the, the Episcopalians here in the community, Carl and Lillian and that whole family, they didn't go to church. And so when they, when, uh, and when Carl passed away, Lillian didn't even have a dress uh, to wear. So somebody loaned her the dress and uh, the little Episcopal church here in Flat Rock uh, conducted a memorial service before they took his body down to Atlanta and cremated it and then took it on up to Illinois. Uh, the, his, his children, Margaret edited the poems or the letters that Carl and her mother wrote to each other. Uh, Janet was not capable of doing anything, but Helga wrote. Helga was a very good writer and has a lot. And the granddaughter, the daughter of Helga, wrote uh, a lot uh, for the National Park Service, also wrote a book called My Connemara, uh, in which she talks about her grandfather, whom they called Bupong. I think I'm pronouncing that right, any of you folks that are around, but Bupong. And uh, Carl would uh, wrap up uh, a sandwich and an orange and an apple and put his guitar and they would go off into the woods and they would spend the whole day in a walk with Carl, uh, looking at the different trees and what, using their imaginations and picking up leaves and acorns and all that and having a wonderful day with Bupong. And that's where, if you read uh, the Rutabaker stories, mm -hmm. that's who he was writing it for, was mm -hmm. for his grandchildren that had their imaginations just on fire every time grandpa would take our bupong would take them out into the woods and uh, it's it's just uh, they loved him and he loved them and it's a great story and uh, but uh, yeah he 
Uh, Helga is the one I would look at. Mm -hmm. She's written quite a few things. Very good writer, very good writer. Our next question is from Alan. They ask, how many books did he really have? 10,000, really? Jefferson's yep. library was only 4,000. <laughs> no, uh, you got to remember, Alan, that he sold a lot of his stuff to the, I think it was the University of Illinois. A lot of his papers, a lot of his books, and a lot of things like that. But if you've ever been to Connemara, that whole house is a library. I mean, you, you can go up and down every one of the floors and uh, you can look up in his office and there are stacks of books there. Uh, and he, uh, I have heard stories that people would go to visit him and he'd give them books. Mm -hmm. he, would, he would give them books. Uh, so he, uh, I think he promoted reading and yeah, I'd say 10,000 is easy. And if you are a lover of books, which I profess, and as you can see here, uh, you collect books. And I would say, what well, do you got a thousand books behind us here? I think a lot of people have got, have got a thousand. We are a reading country. Thank you. You know, I love that. Yeah, that's always my biggest item whenever I move. It's, it's the books. <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, <laughs> always oh. the books. I, um, okay, it, we... We have time for two more quick questions. Um, the first one is, what is your favorite poem by Sandberg for children? Mm. I don't have a favorite. I for children? That would be something out of Rudebeck. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's... It's the whole series of stories. And what's so lovely, in the summer when the playhouse is open and they have apprentice, apprentices uh -huh. living on campus, they perform at the outdoor stage and they do part of the stories. And it's poetry in motion. You have the singers and the dancers and the readers. And I go frequently because it's a little hike to do this and sit with children and watch their eyes. And it's almost a foreign language to them, poetry. <laughs> and to watch their eyes, they've never heard anything like, like these tales. So it's the whole, it's not a poem. It would be the genre of rutabaga stories. But I mean, how can you, you've got a character who has a popcorn hat and popcorn mittens and popcorn shoes. I mean, what what's kid, not to love? What kid is not going to love that? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah. The last question is, um, <clears throat> if you sum up Oh, I, well, okay, two quick ones if we can fit them in. Uh, was he ever poet laureate? Did he yes. know Robert Frost? Yes, and uh, he was an honorary poet mm -hmm. laureate of the United States, something mm -hmm. like 1967, uh, maybe, or no, 65. Uh, he won the Pulitzer Prize mm -hmm. twice. Uh, yeah, he, uh, but his, his favorite uh, his was he was given an award by a Girl Scout troop, mm -hmm. and he loved that award. And then the NAACP gave him an award. Uh, I, I forget what the name of it is, but he cherished that. Mm -hmm. He was the only civilian who had ever addressed a joint session of Congress. And he did that on the 150th uh, birthday of Abraham Lincoln. Oh, wow. And oh, he wow. won the uh, Presidential Medal of Freedom. He oh, won wow. That. So he had all these things that were just kind sort of laying around in the house. But the Girl Scout was the most important one. Most important. He had death mask of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, that's, why, that's why he got to visit the house. And uh, there is more and more and more. It, it's, a, it's a treasure trove. The Smithsonian would love it. I have no doubt of that. <laughs> um, last quick question. If you sum up his writing style, how would you describe it? Mm. Free verse. Mm -hmm. It was free verse and nobody knew what to do with it. And all you English lit majors out there and all you people studying poetry will have a great time mm -hmm. trying to box in Carl Sandburg. It'll make you twitch. It'll make you crazy. It'll make you love drinking goat's milk. Or bourbon. Our bourbon, yeah, but it was is free verse. That's 
the best I can say. He was a newspaper man. He was a poet. He, I, he wrote from his heart and his imagination, which were just beautiful. He's a beautiful human being. We're so lucky to have to live here in the same or breathe the same air he breathed. Look at the same mountain ranges he looked at. Walk on the same roads, walk through the same house. We get to live in that environment that he lived in. And if you love his poetry and you love his work, you walk up there, you can't help but hear him. He's there. Oh, sorry. No, don't apologize. So this is the perfect time um, for us to transition over. And if you want to read us uh, what you were going to share with us before, that would be wonderful. Okay. This is the uh, this is the first scene, the first page of my play called The Sandbergs of Connemara. And uh, Sandberg, there is a pool of light down stage right. And a man walks into that pool of light and it is Carl Sandberg. And he says, the words, it's always been about the words. The words that drift like smoke as the wind gently whispered through the summer leaves. The wind that caresses all things is there. And so are the words. The words that spring from this new land, still raw and wild, untouched and calling to those that reach out to catch them. Words from those that boarded ships from ancient faraway places to find a better life here. I am born of this new land from an ancient past. I am one of those that chase the words of this new land of which I am said to belong. I am riding in a boxcar, hiding from the bulls that throw the hobo to the hard, rich ground that only the moccasin-covered feet of the true natives of this land had touched before. I ride the rails with others of my tribe, searching, always searching, hearing the words of the first people spoken on the wind. I see the fields of wheat swaying to the rhythm of the wind. I feel the sting of rain on my dirty, dry face. I taste the wet of thunder from the sky. I am becoming a part of this America, this new land that paints time with sound and color and texture all made up of words. Words that cry out to be written, spoken, or sung. I am a hobo hearing a new song of this America, sung by wind chasers searching for something beyond a home and family and faith, searching for words to put to paper, to put to song, to put on the wind. The land is finding her breath, drawn and sung around the fire at night by hobos on the move across a vast plane of creation. Words that disappear into the night, sung by voices of heart across the sweet maiden fair of America. I am a wind chaser, a wordsmith, a hobo that rides the rails. I am hearing the voice of America. And I will sing her song. Thank you. That was so fabulous. Thank you for sharing that with us. Well, thank you, Quill. If I had goat's milk, I would salute you. <laughs> Bourbon will do. <laughs> or water. <laughs> Whichever. Uh, thank you so much to all three of you for such an inspiring program about Carl Sandburg and his time at Flat Rock. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time out this evening to share this wonderful history about this man with us. Thank you very much. Our pleasure. Thanks for having us. Come thank see you us. Very much. And thank you to all those of you who joined us this evening. 
Um, as everyone has said, please do um, go to Flat Rock and check out Connemara and all the wonderful things that the area has to offer. Um, and we hope to see you at our next History and Highballs program, Meshugana, uh, happening on Thursday, May 13th at 7 p.m. Uh, we will see you soon. Stay safe. Be well, everybody. Have a good night. Bye.